Water Policy and Strategy in Hawaii. Participating in this discussion, Leah Bremer, Associate Specialist, Water Resources Research Center, UH Manoa, and Director, Environmental Policy and Planning Group, UH Economic Research Organization, or UHERO. Thomas Giambaluca, Professor, Director, Water Resources Research Center, UH Manoa. Kaleo Manuel, Deputy Director, Commission on Water Resource Management, State of Hawaii. Dana O'Connell, Program Director, Hawaii Community Foundation. Kristen Reynolds, Director, One World, One Water. And Joanna Sito, Environmental Health Program Administrator, Environmental Management Division, State of Hawaii, Department of Health. Moderating this panel will be Aurora Kagawa Viviani, Assistant Professor, Geography and Environment, UH Manoa, and Commissioner, Commission on Water Resource Management, State of Hawaii. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Aurora. Okay, thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, it's with great pleasure that I um, am able to bring, convene this conversation today. Um, and it's intended as a discussion of water policy, policy making, and strategy relevant to present and future Hawaii related challenges. The panel, the goal of the panel for me is to support rich exchange around how these water challenges are defined, how we approach them, and how we might design and implement holistic and inclusive solutions and better coordinated approaches. So here with us, we have representatives from state agencies with the commission and Department of Health. We have philanthropy represented with, um, and we also have um, the consulting sector with Kristen and the university. And again, kind of carrying forth Kamu's theme of what is the role of the university in this, we also need to think about what is the role of the university in engaging with these other decision-making bodies. And it's, I think it's something that as researchers, we often say we're doing policy relevant work. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of things to overcome with that. And so that's where we're hoping to go with this exchange. Um, so I'm going to just dive right in. We have a really short amount of time and a large panel and some really pressing questions. And then we'll have space at the end. I'm going to make sure we have space at the end for audience questions. Um, like before, we'll take them from the seats, if you can project loudly. And, and think about the kind of questions that aren't being covered in the first three themes. So the first question I have, and as, as I ask it, as, as, as we take responses, and I'm just going to let the panelists choose who wants to come forth. Um, please, as you take your first response, just give a little brief um, intro, we don't have as much time as panel one, to how you came to your work in Hawaii. Um, so we understand your positionality. Um, the first question is, you know, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Red Hill and also other recent water crises have stimulated an unprecedented explosion of public interest in water. What do you see as the imperative and the opportunity of the moment? And um, it's open to all. I know some people might not want to jump in, so I will just tag someone first and point to um, Joanna. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aurora. <laughs> so the Department of Health's mission is to, Im to protect and improve the health and environment of the people of the state of Hawaii. And so we do need to look at the entire state when we look at the protections of the environment. Um, one of the department's goals is to prevent pollution and promote and preserve the health and natural resources of the state um, through the promotion of resource conservation, as mentioned earlier, and the protection and enhancement of the air and water quality. So my division, the Environmental Management Division, is responsible for maintaining the statewide um, programs for controlling air and water pollution in the state and for assuring safe drinking water, as well as for the proper management of solid and hazardous waste, to, which may impact the quality of our groundwater and surface waters. Uh, the division also regulates the state's wastewater program and supports the increased use of um, and distribution of reuse water. So the water quality plan um, that we have currently promotes the upgrade and replacement of cesspools, which many of you probably know of. Uh, we also are increasing our water reuse strategies statewide, um, with, which can be seen in Maui County predominantly. It's also located here on Oahu. Um, we would like to expand that out to the other islands. 
uh, we protect existing and potential sources of drinking water through the regulation of wastewater um, disposal through injection wells, so the underground injection control program. Uh, we also coordinate groundwater protection activities across different jurisdictions in the division. So this includes the underground storage tank program, which in turn regulates the Red Hill facility. Um, we also assess the susceptibility of public drinking water sources and protect them from contamination. Um, so I didn't do what Aurora had asked at the very beginning, which was introduce myself and my connection to water. Uh, my father was a, was a uh, Board of Water Supply employee for many years, and I learned about the water hydrologic cycle from him. Um, my family is very much into, into water, but not necessarily playing in the water. Um, so uh, my connection to the water also extends to surface water, where I started in the department in the clean water branch in the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System protecting the waters that we recreate in. Um, and uh, about 10 years ago, I moved into the Safe Drinking Water Branch, and now I am in the division, which also regulates and um, protects through the different media, the um, air and soil also. So, thank you. Yeah, so. Okay, I'll jump in. Okay. Um, Aloha, everyone. Uh, Kaleo Manuel, deputy with the Water Commission. So I think um, the question was around opportunities, right, with Red Hill. And so I think in my connection and work with water over the past decade, um, there's just apathy, right? We as community have lost that pilina that was referenced before, that relationship with water, um, the relationship with place. And to me, Red Hill is an opportunity for us to like never do that again. <laughs> so that we all learn from this and are proactive and are more engaged um, and hold our decision makers and agencies accountable. So take advantage of a good crisis, right? And not wait for something to happen. To me, that's an opportunity, right? And it's a way to shift our behaviors as a collective um, and, and really invest in this invaluable resource that we talk about um, that the first panel really eloquently wove together this picture of water or Vai. Um, and so to me, that's, that's an opportunity for us as a collective and as a society that we all have kuleana uh, individually and collectively to take care and steward this, this resource. Um, and a lot of that I will try to weave in with the Water Commission. So how many of you, this is a question asked, how many of you know or have heard about the Commission on Water Resource Management? Raise your hand. All right, so it's completely opposite from any poll we do in every other space in the state of Hawaii. So uh, we usually get maybe, and I have staff here, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, maybe one out of 20 people will raise their hand, maybe two out of 20. So this is a great space, um, so I don't have to go into our kuleana of what the Water Commission does. But technically, we're, Kekahu Vaipono is our model, right? We're supposed to be the trustee who oversees stewarding of water resources. But you can't steward what you don't know, right? And so one of our major kuleana is to inventory and understand what water resources exist here in Hawaii. Um, and the only way you can do that is if you have a relationship with that water resource. And so for me um, and our responsibility with the commission is to continue to um, elevate and create those connections. We're a connector, a bridger of community with place, a community with data, agency with community. Um, so it really is about this pilina that, you know, Kiana again, referenced throughout the whole part of our keynote. And what I think Red Hills, this crisis has, has helped us do is to recreate that connection and relationship with one another in this island setting. Okay, it's fun. It's like Tom had something to say and then Kristen. Yeah. Okay. Hello, I'm Tom. Um, okay, how many people have heard of the Water Resources Research Center? <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, so uh, that's where I am, and um, how I came to uh, do what I do. Uh, I could trace my ancestry. Uh, all my ancestors come from islands, not these islands, unfortunately. Um, Sicily, Scotland, Ireland. Um, but my interest in 
what brought me to Hawaii in the first place was actually the ocean and surfing. Uh, but that led to an interest in weather and climate, which when I got to Hawaii led to uh, looking at the land and water on the land. And that has kind of guided all of my interests and, and work since that time. Uh, so this opportunity, this time that we have right now, I think is a, one that we should not squander. I mean, we're paying a heavy price for the, you know, the lack of attention, uh, the lack of, uh, of response to calls to action. Uh, but it does present us with an opportunity because uh, you know, we have so much public awareness right now. And the university you know, really has a, has a duty, has a responsibility to act on that, uh, on that opportunity. And we're trying to do that. Kristen? Um, I came to water. Yeah. I think you keep talking. Oh, okay. The volume will go I'll up. just okay. <laughs> um, I grew up with uh, living on freshwater bodies and just loved water, and then came to Hawaii by way of American Samoa, by way of Rhode Island. I was at a conference when I had just submitted a modeling report where I. Um, exaggerated the impacts of an oil spill greatly and the client just paid and no one came back to me. I didn't get fired or anything. So I was like, okay, this engineering work I'm doing is not making a difference. Um, uh, and so I met somebody from American Samoa. They offered me a job and I took it on the spot and then spent three years there and um, came to Hawaii after and about 2013 started um, One World, One Water to really connect engineering and policy and really try to make the connections for the solution space that we really, um, I think where all of the really good knowledge is, is at those kind of connection points. So really appreciated hearing some of that um, historical knowledge of connection as well. Um, but one very discreet opportunity from my engineering brain that I always think about is, um, when Halava Shaft had to shut down, and I know the num Ernie could share the exact numbers, but if you're eliminating about 10 MGD, um, there is a Pearl Harbor wastewater treatment plant that was built in 1969 in desperate need of upgrades, and that is 13 MGD, and that could all be reuse water um, so that the Navy doesn't need to be pulling that 13 for drinking water sources. So one very discreet thing that I think could come out of this opportunity is get that 13 MGD plant upgraded and you, to recycle water and use that recycled water before taking any more from the resource, let the resource um, flow its way naturally. So um, I guess in getting that done, we just need to advocate for that to happen. Um, I think their funding is there and <laughs> just have to make it happen. So one discreet action. <laughs> Dana. Yeah, um, I'll jump in here. So Dana Okano, um, I work at Hawaii Community Foundation. And so I know philanthropy is not a typical partner in these kinds of meetings and spaces. Um, but part of why we are involved, sorry, I'll back up. I'm from Hilo, and so water, right, rain. Um, but actually, I, I didn't really, like, it was just too much, right, when I was growing up, and so I didn't have an appreciation of it until, actually, I was serving as a Peace Corps volunteer literally in the middle of nowhere in West Africa in this little village. Um, and they had a drought when I was there, and that was a real shocking eye-opener to me because I always took rain and water for granted. Um, and so when I came back from Peace Corps, I came back here to UH Manoa and went to grad school and got my PhD in watershed management. So it, it kind of you know, brought me home, if you will. Um, anyway, so working at the Community Foundation, you know, one of, um, so I'm the program director for our natural environment programs. And one of the programs I coordinate is our fresh water initiative. And um, that initiative started because the Community Foundation was starting to look at, hey, wait, what are the long-term impacts of climate change on um, you know, many things in our society, including things like our long-term potable water supply? And so uh, they pulled together an advisory council um, made up of researchers right next to me, um, you know, water commission, uh, water utility, sorry, I'm pointing to all our uh, freshwater council members in the room, um, large landowners, ag industry, 
um, and others and all came together and really looked at what are the things that we can do to improve and secure our long-term water security um, in the, uh, you know, going into the future. And the group really came down to, you know, an overarching goal of, you know, we need to, um, make up 100 million gallons per day within our water supply system, but really by focusing on water conservation, water reuse, and water recharge. Um, so we don't have like a direct stake in what is happening in Red Hill, except that as was said on an earlier panel, right? Ernie's been flagging this for years, right? Um, and including on our, on our Freshwater Initiative uh, Council. Um, I think the opportunity, as Kaleo said, is that Red Hill is helping to put um, a focus on our water needs, because the thing is Red Hill is not the only water issue we have, right? We have many water issues, and they're all you know, coming to head, if you will, and um, they all need different ways of looking at and addressing them. And if nothing else, if Red Hill helps to shine a light on okay, we need to start looking at and managing our water differently. We'll, we'll take that win, even though it was at a drastic cost, but let's use this opportunity to look at all of our water issues we're facing in the state, not just Red Hill. Thanks. Um, riffing off of that, and, and knowing that we have like five more minutes on this topic before <laughs> we have to move on, do we have the capacity we need to address the current and future sort of crises? I mean, we can front end it, but also do we have the capacity to respond? And, and if not, what needs to happen? And especially because a lot of these conversations tend to focus on water sort of from a geology, hydrology, engineering perspective. I also want to make room for um, Leah as a social scientist to, to weigh in on you know, what, what are those people like engagement? Where, where, I'm blathering, so take it from there. Like, what capacity do we need, and how do we to deal with future crisis, current and future crisis? That's a big, that's a big question. But you want to start with our connection to water. So let me yes. first start. Yeah. So, um, so I grew up in Mililani, and I love hearing the stories from the first panel on their amazing connections to their fresh water in Hawaii. I mean, when I think about my first like three or. I don't have a great memory, for first of all, but when I think about my memories growing up, fresh water here, sad, kind of sadly, are first I remember when we couldn't get water from our taps in Mililani because of the pineapple fields. Like I distinctly remember that having to fill up, um, and then there's you know um, sort of the repercussions of that. And I, I remember fishing with my dad in Wahiwa Reservoir <laughs> and throwing the bluegill and the tilapia back, right, and and. Never, never eating what we caught. And then I remember paddling in the Alawai <laughs> in high school. So, you know, it makes me kind of sad. I mean, I have many wonderful memories of hiking in the Ko'olaus and, you know, being in the ocean, but the freshwater memories growing up in central Oahu and, you know, having parents that had moved there in their 20s. And so, anyway, just to say I had a wonderful childhood, but uh, it, it like makes me so happy to hear those, those memories of water. Um, and how I guess I came to water, I was a, <clears throat> I'm a sort of a, a accidental academic because I'm, I'm not very good at being focused on one thing. So, I mean, I was a psychology major in undergrad and then um, ended up being a conservation biology master's student and kind of worked in different fields along the way and <clears throat> um, worked some time in Latin America and ended up coming to geography um, for my PhD because I wanted to bring the people back into the, the conversation in, in the world of conservation that I was working in. Um, and I worked in Latin America for a long time and that was where like, I saw these amazing freshwater systems, you know, um, kind of juxtaposed with freshwater crises in, in cities, you know, in Sao Paulo and in Quito. Um, I, lived in, I lived in Ecuador and you know, part of the day you couldn't drink water because um, it was, during the dry season, right? So there's a, and you could never drink the water straight out of the tap. Um, so that's where, you know, I saw the, um, the confluence of land management and water and worked on these programs called water funds, which are, you know, kind of watershed conservation programs that tend to be financed by um, um, cities and other stakeholders that use the water and um, transfer resources to people working in the watersheds, including communities. So anyway, I could go on and on about that. But that, and then I had the opportunity to come back 
to Hawaii and continue working on water. So over the fa past five years, I've really been you know, working both on um, kind of land conservation, um, biocultural restoration projects, as well as, as water. Um, but really consider myself learning. And I, I'm always kind of blown away by a lot of the people working here. Um, that panel is awesome. I mean, I feel like you go a lot of places in the world and you don't see um, the genius that's brought out when you bring people um, together in that way. And Kiana, so good to see you talking again. That's been giving these, these, um, these uh, keynotes. Your, your energy is amazing. So anyway, I'm blabbing. What was I supposed capacity. to say? Capacity. <laughs> capacity. So capacity. Um, gosh, I feel like I'm the worst person to answer that question. You can point but, to someone else. If you... OK, but um, how about Dana? Do you think we have the capacity to answer that question? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, I'll just say in the sense that, um, I mean, yes, we know how. I think we know what we need to do, right? Again, referring back to the first panel, right? Like, the knowledge is there. Um, I think we have a lot of workforce struggles across the state. We see that with all of the partners that we try to coordinate with, and that's at every level. Level, It's um, state and county agencies, it's nonprofits, like everyone is struggling with workforce. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I'll stop there and let others chime in. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. So how, I'll ask the audience question, where the Water Commission statewide mandate, how many staff do you think the Water Commission has? There's like one, two, three, four of us in the room, so at least four. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's 21 of us statewide. That includes me. So with such a huge mandate, when you talk about capacity, we don't have the capacity at the staff and resource level. I mean, we just don't have enough hours in the day or staff to do the job well of knowing what our resources are and then being able to manage that effectively. Um, with that said, I know there's you know, a desire to, or there's been great models of alternatives to this statewide regulatory framework that have been discussed prior to this. And so it's really about creating partnerships and building relationships with community and people of place and really elevating, I think, their solution sets that they've, they can come up with on their own um, that we just have to codify, right, and or support and, and invest in. And oftentimes we don't invest in that proactively. So I'm a planner by training. I didn't talk about how I got to water. So I'm a planner by training. So what frustrated me the most was the disconnect between land use and water resource management, which still exists in the state of Hawaii. Um, and a lot of that work came when I was working at Hawaiian Homes, which are some of the most desolate parcels of land that didn't include sugarcane lands, that didn't include forest reserves, that had zero water on it, yet we were supposed to rehabilitate an entire race of people. Um, so when you talk about, we talked about equity and inequity and injustice, I came from that space. And that's my water connection, is coming from a place of deficit and scarcity, but trying to create thriving, resilient communities out of that. And so the systems that are in place really have, have not been supportive to provide the capacity needed for us to be water resilient in the state. And that's just one example within the, the, the agencies that I've worked in. And so now coming to the Water Commission, um, I went from DHHL, which had about 120 staff for statewide mandates, to 20. So we're, we should be trending this way and not this way um, in our investment in, in, in our water future. And as Kamana said eloquently, right, um, you know, water is what connects us. It should be what connects us. But we don't invest in it, right? Like we don't actually, historically, we invested into cleaning Hawaii or taking care of our forests, right? And, and malamaing water from Mauka to Makai, and there was cost related to that. So I'm looking at Commissioner Vak, who always reminds us of economies. Um, but we've shifted into a new economy. So how do we use the current economy and reinvest in, in our water resources? So there's some policies and strategies that have been thrown out there, right, to help build that capacity. But nothing's really got past that line, um, in my opinion. And so we're struggling. We are, are struggling to try to meet the needs with limited capacity. Okay. Man, I, I have a burning question now. If we got the commission side capacity, what's the DOH capacity and, and, and needs? And it's, it's, it's important because we're in a university space and it's, we are training. The, the department um, appreciates all of the hard work and the projects that the UH um, Water Resource Research <coughs> Center and um, the other departments of the de 
of the school have been providing to us. Um, we continue to look for that opportunity to have the assistance to get the science um, and the data that we need for the development of regulations that we are going to be um, imposing on our communities. Um, we want to make sure that we're reaching out to the water communities to find out what, um, what will work and what will not work. Um, sitting on the commission, um, we do vote to restore water to streams, but we also need to look at what's impacting the, um, the downstream user that is no longer receiving that water. So the, one of the first things I learned um, being on, sitting on, helping sit on the commission was that um, one of the users of a stream um, utilized that water to support the downstream agricultural uses of their communities. Um, but it was also, um, they also had another source, a groundwater source. And so when the commission voted not to allow them to continue to use the stream water, they needed to improve their uh, groundwater, um, their groundwater from that um, to support their community. Um, that, I think that community hasn't done what it needs to do, so it is, a, it is a process. But there are always pros and cons to everything that we do, and we need to find the best way to um, get to where we need to go, um, protective of the communities and the environment. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say was that um, we should be encouraging developers to take the initiative to um, construct um, on-site water reuse water systems. Um, this was something that was brought up when, um, when we, heard, we had the, um, the Red Hill situation come up um, and Ernie had mentioned that there may, have, there may be repercussions on development, um, water being one of the reasons why you needed, to have, you needed to have the water credits in order to do your development. Um, so some developers would come in and they started talking about this one on-site reuse water systems. And that was great. And I was very impressed and I was so looking forward to seeing these projects come to light. And then they stopped. So um, these, are, these are things that we can, we can look forward to. Um, I like to think that we can develop environmentally, and environmentally sound methods that we make sure that we're protecting our um, communities and our environment and our plants and animals because it is a one big, um, we are one big world. One health um, is everything that's connected together. Um, and so, we need to make sure that we're taking care of that. Thanks. And, and Joanne, I have a very blunt question, which is how many job openings does DOH anticipate having in the next 10 years? And what are the skills that young people need to be lining up for? Thank you for that. Uh, we have environmental health specialists who are taking, um, collecting water samples, um, making sure that the data that we're receiving from um, different communities in air, water, and soil is uh, meeting regulatory requirements. Um, right now, the, for instance, the Safe Drinking Water Branch is about 20 people. Um, they are at half at this point. So, and that branch has been doing this Red Hill response with that number of people. So kudos to them and to the rest of the division because of the um, support that the rest of the division brought to um, the response effort for the emergency. Um, there are, I want to say, 25% vacancy rate in the department at this point. Um, and we are looking at, um, I keep signing these separation notices, which is <laughs> horrible, um, but they're retiring. And so we are having that silver tsunami. Um, workforce development is what we're looking to encourage. Um, I want to get out to the high schools, actually, um, and the, actually the elementary and middle schools, because that's where the, like you said, six years old, right? Somebody said six years old is when they decided, or fourth grade, right? You said fourth grade. <laughs> so these are, those are the, the times that you want to impress upon the students that 
water is a great, um, a, a great way to connect and be proactive in um, supporting our communities. Um, yeah, thank you, sorry. Thanks. You guys taking notes, educators in the room? Kamu's already thinking about his students, so. Um, okay, let's move on to our next big challenge. It's climate change. And I'm gonna throw the first question to Tom. Um, what hydrologic and environmental changes are we expecting to experience in the next couple decades with climate change? Tell us, tell us the straight truth. If I had a straightforward answer to that, I'd be uh, somewhere else right now. But uh, uh, that is a, a difficult challenge. Um, and there is a, I think there's a big gap in knowledge between uh, what the scientific community is, uh, is working on and what most other people uh, you know about or are aware of. Uh, for us here in Hawaii, there's a, a few things that we, we clearly know. Uh, one is that it is getting warmer. And we know that very well, and it will continue to get warmer. In fact, uh, the most up-to-date scientific publication on warming in Hawaii was uh, published by Aurora uh, within the last couple of years. And so it, it shows us that uh, not only is it getting warmer, but what Aurora showed is that it's, um, it was the first to show is that it is actually warming very fast down at sea level where most of us live. And why is that important to water? Well. It, Temperature has a big influence on water use because uh, it is a, one of the factors that controls the evaporation of water. And so irrigation requirements uh, in particular for in urban areas, but also in agriculture, are strongly affected by that warming. So we'll need more water um, because it's getting warmer. Uh, the big question though, a bigger question though, is you know, what's going to happen to rainfall? And that remains uh, pretty uncertain as far as what's going to happen in the future, something we're working on actively. We've also been looking at how rainfall has changed in, in, the, in the past, going back even 500 years. Uh, but in the recent decades, in the last, say, 40 years or so, it has gotten drier, and, and it, we are in a relatively dry state of our climate now, and I think most people uh, recognize that. We're in a statewide drought right now. Um, uh, but how that's gonna play out in the future is, is, remains pretty uncertain. Some things we would say are consensus or approaching a consensus are that um, we'll probably continue to have drying trend in the lower elevations and the leeward side um, so that it, the dry areas where most of us live, work, and do our farming and so forth uh, will continue to get drier where, and therefore we'll need more water uh, for irrigation and so forth. And, um, and the windward areas, the, the wetter areas, will probably not get drier and may get a little bit wetter, which is kind of good news. Now that's, that's talking about the mean, like the average amount of rainfall we get per year. At the same time that we might be having drying over a large part of the state, we also expect to be experiencing bigger uh, extreme rainfalls. So higher rainfalls, flood producing rainfalls. And we are starting, we may be starting to see that already. A uh, number of people were talking about Halilea on the north side of Kauai and the Waipa rain gauge uh, located there experienced almost 50 inches of rainfall in 24 hours in April 2018. That is the United States record for 24-hour rainfall. So that's an indication of where we could be heading. And so less rainfall overall in many areas, but when it does come, it, it comes in big, heavy storms, bigger than we've ever had before. So with that, Hard truth. Um, does existing water policy have us adequately prepared? Um, don't all jump, guys. <laughs> why or why not? What must change? So, Kristen, you were, you're raising your hand or scratching uh, your head, but I'll call you. Yeah. Um, uh, well, of course, the answer is no, right? <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. Um, we do have a few things going for us. The memory that was shared this morning is amazing. Moving from a place of culture and love of the resource is very powerful. And um, we also have 
uh, political control over our watershed from Malka to Makai, although you know there's silos within it. Um, so I think we have a lot of things going for us, but we really do have to move very quickly and stretch beyond our current policies, rules, regulations, and we we can't wait to set up the whole new framework and build the whole capacity. We almost need to just build the plane as we fly by trying to reach across and stretch and collaborate and figure out how we can make what we have work. Um, one of the things that um, the city and county of Honolulu has done is put together a one water panel and an ordinance to collaborate on building resilient infrastructure. Um, and that happened pretty quickly. And we don't have, I've had the opportunity to help facilitate that. We don't have all the answers, but we're talking about the problems and we're trying to take those next steps. Um, I think the challenges that we have are so big and the, um, I guess this gets to research too and applied research, like it's, there's a tendency to want to study it until you get, get the complete answer and the reality is it's just always going to be a trade-off and so just doing that next best thing and making those connections and trying to, out of every piece of research, every piece of work that you do, have some sort of applied connection and um, I think is important. It'll, hopefully build those things that can, can pick up speed. Maybe Dana, do you have comments from Freshwater Initiative? Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I kind of said it earlier when I was doing the introduction of the initiative, right? We, um, we were looking at this information and this data about what's happening and, and I think that was, or I know that was the foundation for how they came up with, with the goals and the focus on expanding things like water reuse, which I love to hear Department of Health is supportive of on-site reuse because we are also uh, very strongly encouraging that. Um, and, you know, looking for other ways um, to break down the silos and, and, you know, change the way we currently manage our water systems. I think there's um, a lot more that we can be doing. I think we do have some good models that already exist out there. Um, I think we probably need more, um, again, pulling from, I feel like just everything the first panel said, I just want to ditto. So pulling from what they said earlier, I think we need to have more um, kind of bravery in our leadership in water resources to be able to move into different ways of managing water than maybe we have in the past, right? Um, and only through that will we be able to implement, like there's models out there, there's ideas out there, um, some of them going back, some of them are new and, and looking forward, um, but it really does take that, that bravery and leadership to be able to do that, to accomplish that. So we're having a great exchange here, um, and it sounds like the One Water panel is converging, important conversations, and the panel one talked about, kind of, or Kamu mentioned, that we have these top-down approaches and bottom-up. Are there spaces, where are those spaces where the incredible interests, public interest in water and, and community interest can really get channeled into these capacity gaps to help solve our challenges? Can you describe anything that exists right now? Or? Any panelists? I, I, I see it monthly with commission meetings, but that's not the place where formative discussions happen. Where are those spaces? Uh, I can't say that it's really uh, an established space, but I think an, an appropriate place for that would be the university. And so that, that is something that we could aspire to and to become that uh, space. So. Bacillus, can we do that? <laughs> yeah, just, just to build on what Tom is saying. I mean, I think as we think about the future of the Water Resources Research Center, right? So a water center could be truly a holistic interdisciplinary center where people are working on water from all angles, right? We, we have a great um, center, but we're, we're dominated by engineers primarily, right? It's, that's sort of the training I think that people initially think about if you're gonna go into water, you need to be an engineer and be able to do hydrologic modeling and all of that, and that's very important, but we also need, you know, we need lawyers, we need social scientists, we need indigenous scholars, we need, um, you know, and we have 
different people working across the university in these different fields. So I, I think it would be super exciting to bring together a, a more um, holistic, interdisciplinary, and applied space to work on water. So maybe that's the Water Resources Research Center, or maybe it's some other platform. But yeah, Dana. So I love this, and yeah. if I can build off of this, um, yes, and you know, one of the observations I have working in community is um, it, it sometimes feels like there is a disconnect between research at the university and management of resources on the ground. And, and I get it, right? I, the way universities are structured is, right, you have, you have to do your peer review publications and you have kind of these standard things that I understand are standard across the country, but they don't always necessarily address the management on the ground. I would love to see UH embrace, um, you know, rewarding our professors for doing things that actually address management needs on the ground rather than just peer review publications. Um, and, you know, I can give an example just <laughs> um, because I really want to, you know, again, encourage like if Department of Health is, is supportive and interested uh, in, okay, yeah, let, let's get people to do on-site reuse systems. Well, that means they need to update their administrative rules to reflect that. That would be something great for the university to be able to help them with, right? So because it's a practical need on the ground, it will benefit Hawaii. How can we do that? Um, how do we, I, I think there's many examples we could go on and on of things that, you know, the very smart minds at the university could really help plug in and help solve problems that the managers just, I, you know, they have ha half their staff is vacant, right? They don't have the bandwidth to be able to tackle those issues. I, I'd love to flip it and instead of, you know, what I hear is like, we are gonna convene instead like, go to the community, like that's where we need to have these conversations and a way too often I think, I mean, as was mentioned, like I gotta work, right? Community has to pay their bills. Um, we in agency and academia and, you know, really have and serve the public, but what does public service look like? Does that mean they have to come to us and then we can serve them? How do we proactively have these conversations about water, we've talked about this, and not wait for the crisis to happen, right? So I think, Yes, while there's great, like this um, aggregating of knowledge and this coming together may be held and helped by the university, I do think we need to go out to community and not forget the people that we serve and the resource itself. I mean, it doesn't make sense for us to, again, manage from Oahu when we have uh, you know, uh, islands in the state. And so I, I just don't wanna forget about that. I think we way too often in these spaces forget about the people that are you know, working out in the valleys um, that don't have internet, that can't zoom in, that can't pay $100 to be here with us. Um, and that is inequity and the systems continue to allow that to happen and these conversations happen. So I just challenge us, right, as academics, as professionals to not forget that that's at the core of what we need to do, right, to build that capacity. It's a great segue into our final theme. Oh, Tom, have a comment. Uh, just yeah. to reinforce what Kaleo just said, um, and that, that Communication with uh, with the community, with people, uh, is so important to the university, and it goes both ways. It's you know we have a we have a mandate to do research and education and to make that uh, available to people that need it. So that's one direction. But we also need to listen to the community to define the problems. Right? Are we working on the right things? Are we producing the things that are making a difference? And if we don't get out there, we don't we we don't get that feedback. I think that's super important that it be a dialogue, in two ways. Yeah. Um, so that's great. The last question has to do with um, equity and inclusion. Um, and so I'll just let you, there's, I want to build off of that, um, Khalil, um, your comment about engaging community. How do you see and how have you found ways that are really effective in engaging community and decision making processes um, as we work toward to addressing historical inequities and injustices? Um, you know, how, how do we, how do we, vision forward and implement it. Yeah, I love the, uh, I don't know who said it, but the other comment is real. Like, until you see yourself as part of that community, you're, you are again top downing or you're distancing yourself from that. And so I think we collectively have to own the good and the bad. Um, and to me, that's, that's relationship building, it's pilina, it's trust building, 
it's honoring honoring that inequity and the trauma of the past. And even if you're new to Hawaii, you know, just know that you're coming into it and don't just think that history starts the day you landed here. Um, we, we all have a kuleana to, to own that, right? And you cannot, the second you, you separate yourself, that's not my issue, um, it's not gonna help any of us. So to me, that's, that's equity, inclusion, diversity, all of that. Um, so just avoid the other, um, own it, and then really just create relationship, talk to each other. I think some of the hardest and most successful things that I've gotten through in my short career has been sitting at tables with people that I completely disagree with um, and have different value sets, but I just better understanding what those values are and what their values are and seeing where we overlap, right? And let's work from that place of commonality uh, and understanding and then build from there, right? Instead of seeing what's wrong in the situation or what, what's, what, what's absent. So working from a, you know, asset-based, value-based kind of approach. That's, yeah, help. Um, in a pre-gaming session, Joanna, you mentioned this is referred to in EPA language as environmental justice. What, what does DOH have in your mandate um, related to that? Okay, so environmental justice means the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And the department um, is following the EPA mandate of Justice 40, which is mandating that at least 40% of the benefits of certain federal programs must flow to disadvantaged uh, communities, which are also called DACs, um, acronyms. They love acronyms. Um, so Justice 40 is a whole of government approach and it's um, one of the biggest um, places that you might see it is in the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund and the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. 40% um, of those funds are to be used at disadvantaged communities um, to help support the um, improvements and maintenance, um, not maintenance, improvements of um, the drinking water systems, the um, landfill the landfills, um, surface water, storm water protection, things like that. All right. Do um, members of the Freshwater Council kind of have, have, a, have a mission? Um, and, and can you describe the work being done through, the, well, through those efforts? Are you the Freshwater Council members? Oh, sorry, I guess you're, you're the, yeah. <laughs> staff, staff. Okay, staff, staff. <laughs> People who are involved in these freshwater initiative and freshwater council discussions. Yeah, um, you know, that is a good question. I'll be honest and say, um, because part of the process is owning up to also your mistakes, right? And so when we first convened the freshwater initiative, it did not have a distinct equity lens or goal. And so I do think that's something where we have been weaker in our approach um, though in recent years we have been starting to look at and explore how do we better pull in equitable values, um, you know, find uh, um, ways to better support the, the needs and desires of community. And I think that is still a work in process for us. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for it and we've been doing a lot of learning actually um, we re recently attended a um, U.S. Water Alliance conference and they do a ton of water equity work and it was just really eye-opening and inspirational for us to see how other places across the country have approached the work and what the possibilities are and so we are having active conversations about how do we bring those practices into our setting and, and how we are approaching the work now. And, and it up goes you know, across all different areas of water and, and what that means and looks like. But yeah, Kaleo and Tom also please weigh in. Have anything to add? No. Uh, okay. Well, I can say a little bit, uh, maybe not so much about the, um, the Freshwater Initiative, but just um, the idea of diversity, equity, inclusion when it comes to water is just many faceted. And at the university it means 
you know, our hiring practices, uh, who, who, who do we have working there, and you know, who do they represent, what backgrounds do they bring to the table, and that's really important that we pay attention to that. But uh, as far as the research we do and the problems we're trying to address, we have to recognize that the impacts of environmental change and other, uh, other problems that have to do with water, uh, flood, flooding for example, uh, are not evenly distributed across our community. I mean, they're, they're much more heavily impactful in certain communities, and especially as you go to lower socioeconomic uh, status, then you know, those people are, are, have greater exposure to these problems. And so recognizing that, I think, is important as we direct the kind of research we do to make sure you know, we bring those to light and try to work towards solutions. So I think Leah, yeah. What yeah, role does this your is work? All great discussion. I mean, I think a useful you know, academic framework for equity and justice is thinking about kind of distributive equity, procedural equity, and recognitional equity. You know, a lot of times we just think about distributional, how the benefits and costs are, you know, distributed. Are they even or uneven? And of course, that's critical, but it's also, you know, the recognitional, which kind of Kapoor was. A, alluding to with the water code having indigenous principles, that's a type of, in, of recognitional equity whose values, um, whose worldviews are characterize the decision-making process and the rules to start with, right? If you don't have recognitional equity, I don't think you can ever get to distributional equity and justice. And then, you know, maybe right under procedural and, or sorry, right under recognitional and related to, um, related to it is procedural equity. Who's at the table in decision-making, right? Like, like exactly what people are saying, are, as researchers, are we, are we coming up with our questions in, our, in a room at the university or are we co-producing them with community members and, and how is that done? Um, you know, in all, all of spheres, you can think about that, how the Water Commission does it. That's procedural, which is really important, and then that all influences distributional equity, so that's kind of a geeky academic way of thinking about it, but I think um, it helps me kind of make sure that we're not just thinking about the, the downstream equity component and thinking about the whole our way. <laughs> yes. So at this point, I'm, I mean, I think there might be some ideas and questions. And OK, I already see hands. Um, oh, boy. OK, the first one I saw shot up was Commissioner Buck up there. Yeah. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Uh, specifically to water policy and strategy, I think the elephant in the room is that Despite the most innovative water legislation and our cultural connection to buy, we have no economic framework uh, uh, for water security in Hawaii. No sustainable funding for watersheds. No uh, revenue for managing public trust. So my question is, really to everyone in this room, why does not this community of environmental, social, and cultural people, why have we not been able to move the needle to develop? He addressed it to everyone in the room, so if anyone's hand wants to shoot up again, the 100 pound gorilla. And Kapua is pointing to Kamana, so you can take that one for this panel. Are you serious? Yeah. She was pointing at you, so. vast debates between water as a commodity and water as a public trust and the equity issues that sort of come with the commodification of water. Um, so I think that's a point well taken. I think for me it has to do with priorities. Uh, I'm going to be a little blunt and bold here, but do we ask that same question when it comes to the military? How come there's money <laughs> when it comes to defense all the time? And, and there's not money for water. So I think it's actually a priority issue um, of governance and of decision making. I don't think we should go towards privatizing our, our water systems or expecting um, us to generate private systems to do that. So, but I think it, Mike's point is super well taken. You know, we, we need to fund the commission staff and efforts to you know, make the public trust actualize in our islands, um, but, but I do think it's a it's a value and it's a priority. You follow the budget. The budget is an ethical document in terms of mm. what we really believe in and what we want to support. So 
That's my no easy answer, but my take line. You can keep talking during the lunch hour. There were a whole bunch of other hands raised. Okay, in the center here. Just checking, could the guys in the back hear that question? Yeah. Okay, great. So, I think that's a UH question. <laughs> or, or, or Kristen has, has thoughts. Uh, soft open. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. First of all, I commend you, because crossing spaces like that, doing the non-traditional approach, is where the solutions are, so don't give up on that. That's amazing. We did hear a lot at the US Water Alliance about um, like art and community and transforming these key like water tanks or wastewater treatment plants from a place where people do graffiti to like a central thing that the community celebrates. So I do know that the US Water Alliance has a lot of resources in that. Um, and then historically, um, I heard from Ernie Lau <laughs> that they used to hire the best architects, was that right, Ernie? To do the Board of Water Supply buildings to make them like a piece of art, a piece of the community. And so I think that aspect of like art is really incredible and has a history in Hawaiian water. And it's also part of the solution space for the equity conversation. So how do you bring the community in and have them help co-design something that's maybe previously seen as an eyesore and like a stay out, don't touch, and like people want to you know, charge the gates on um, to something that they're proud of. And um, I just, there's a, also a lot in the green infrastructure, stormwater management space, where architectural aspects and making things beautiful for the community create that multi-benefit. So I think you're like right on um, and keep going. Um, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, soft opening. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that was enough. I can just say that um, that I think it's a good example of the uh, diverse nature of water inquiry. That it can't be found all in one college uh, at the university, and so that I would just encourage you to seek out, um, you know, advice and expertise. You know, across the campus, because you know, water at water, folks interested in water are all over the university. Um, they're not all in one place. So, you know, Water Resource Research Center is one place you could come, but there, there are other academic departments as well. And I was just sorry. I was just going to have one final thing, just more at a practical scale. So, um, I. I did a presentation with um, a water reuse expert who, who does on-site reuse systems in San Francisco for the, um, what is it, AIA Architect Institute of America? Sorry, I forget, yeah, acronym. Um, but their, their Hawaii chapter, right? And we did that last year and did a whole presentation and talking about on-site reuse systems. Um, so, and I know for a fact there are several developers that are looking at it and exploring it. And so sometimes the school might be more, sorry, I feel like I'm picking on UH today. Sometimes the, the school might be more amenable if you can find those, you know, folks already out doing the work um, and saying, hey, we'd really like to have graduates who have experience in designing these types of systems. So, you know, don't let the university be the barrier, like go look for other places to tap in who have influence over the university. Sorry. <laughs> That's, I think it's great. There's a question up there, Kamu Oh, uh, I got a comment, actually. So, and it's kind of related to the commission. 
last four years working in the Poway County Planning Department. And so I want to bring into the conversation uh, governmental land use processes from the state to the county. Yeah, we're missing and how we actually permit. And um, so I see this is a program starting with One World, One Water. And what I would like to see is like one vision that empowers leadership across the different layers of government, all the way down to the community. Um, so being in the department, I've experienced where permitters and long range planners discuss certain permits. And they say, hey, we have a water concern. Here, our water plan says this area is running low. And we, we make that comment but the permitters don't feel that they have the power to say no. Um, why, why do we have to fight that fight? Mm. So if we're talking about leadership, I think part of the leadership is reversing the polarity of the stream that's been going for the last hundred years in terms of political economy and how we make decisions. And we can't just look to the indigenous community and the community at large and say, let's go listen to them. Yes, we gotta listen, but then we gotta go to the pivot points up and down the land use structure and say, this is where we can pivot. This is where community and even regulators don't have to fight their bosses to say, we don't have enough information to say that there's enough water for this. Um, another quick example of this inconsistency in leadership. The Hawaii County Plan said, or the Hawaii County Water Plan, yeah, said, we're running out of water in South Ball. And then later on, we got this proposal to merge two aquifers, and then we're Automatically, when, when that happens, there's a floodgate that's going to drop in the in the Aina, and then that's automatically going to create more availability. I know that's not what they were saying, but in a sense, that was the rationale. They came to our community. We said, no, we don't think that's fono. There's not enough information. So there was one anomaly. I forget what the name of the um, professor was. And it was, like, it was like one anomaly saying, this is proof that water in this aquifer is coming from the, the southern side. So when I talk about consistency and leadership across the board, it includes academia as well. That we're not just going to bump up this one anomaly to suit what the development community is requiring and then, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, but okay. we need that consistency. And yeah. we need that one vision, and we need all sectors to say, we're going to fight this fight together. Mm -hmm. And we're not fighting, we're really, we're not fighting to beat up anybody. <laughs> <laughs> we're fighting to help our society restrain ourselves like when you have an uncle who has diabetes and he's still drinking two, three cans of Pepsi a day. And you say, uncle, I'm sorry. I gotta take that from you. That's the type of leadership we need across the board. Oh. Thank you for that. And I, um, yeah. As we've gone through this panel, I, I realize we're missing really key kind of layer in that, which is the county level um, folks, which is the municipalities, which is the boards. And just quick poll, how many of the audience work at that level of governance? Maui, Hawaii Island, okay. So I hope that we can have, maybe in the lunch breaks, more exchanges, because that's a huge missing um, piece in this conversation, and that'll be a follow-up workshop. Okay, uh, question and comment in the back. Green shirt and then blue shirt after. 
Well, just a question for leadership. Um, wherever you consider leadership to be from, how many tickets were sponsored to allow community to come to this presentation today? Because it's been referenced throughout the day the importance of community, and we all represent community, but it seems very representative of our own fields. So I'm just curious what kind of sponsorship has been created to allow said community to participate in this discussion about community? I can't. Kamu, you're closer to, or Vasilis. Okay. Do you have a response to that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. when I saw <clears throat> when I saw this come across my email, I was like, oh, I want to see this before I knew my friend was speaking. And um, I was like, oh, hundred dollars. And I asked the boss, my wife. I was like, can I go to this? And she's like, how much is it? I was like, it's a hundred bucks. And she went, hmm, don't we have baseball to pay for? And I was like, oh hey, guess I'm not going. And I was blessed for somebody to step forward and say, T, we need you at this meeting. Not knowing really what I was getting informed on, but I'm very blessed to be here. Um, but that's just coming from me, one person in the community. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. So I think it, it pins an opportunity mm -hmm. for future exchanges, definitely. Um, just because your hand was raised, um, can you ask and then um, in the front, yeah. Well, jumping off of the small treatment systems to do water reuse, is there looking at the different requirements for, I'm sure the best plan will have an opinion of the water quality and like for the testing requirements for like running a small like 5,000 gallon a day system or 20,000 gallon a day system, it's quite a huge burden, right? That's the water quality versus like having the EFS So the question is about uh, small, small reuse facilities, and yes, the department is interested in having um, what they call, um, what did they call them, satellite, satellite systems, where they are near parks and decentralized. Thank you. Um, so yes, the department is interested in having that um, brought up in discussions. Um, I don't know if you've already submitted things. So the the branch, the wastewater branch, um, was going to be here this afternoon, but um, they're not able to join. So if you have any questions regarding that, um, please come and see me. Okay, and we have a f spot for a final question. I think. Sorry, and and huh? Yeah, right. Um, Kim Moko, I think. No, sorry. Um. For us in Maui, there was a few of us that was entitled to come to take the grant as Pakomakomakomak. I like the question that the individual behind me from Mokokiawe has asked pertaining to the municipalities and how everything works in county governance as well as the state. And I, I, I want to bring up the issue pertaining to the designation. For us in Komohana, on the west side, designation was really important because of the relationship between the county and the private sector, which we basically wasn't transparent enough for us to consider whether or not the feasibility of utilizing private water, yeah? And at the same time, the county only had, I think maybe 27 or 28% of the, the actual flow of water that comes from the west side. So, the reason why this is important, and I hear where he's coming from. I really hear it from where, where he's coming from because we're dealing with the same thing, especially when it comes from the water, the county water use development plan. And I have a kind of a background relationship with Ava uh, pertaining to our agreement versus disagreement. But I, I really want to entertain in that question also by going into a breakout session to talk about and discover ways of how we can, especially for the Maka and the mud. We'd rather be in the mud than coming to these kinds of things, but they would tell you, it's really important that we be here because somebody got to speak on behalf of the Maka and the mud. 
nobody, and we don't even have the opportunity sometimes, especially when we put into the so-called political arena that said you only get three minutes mm -hmm. of our whole life that is going to be dependent pertaining to our future generations tomorrow. So I, I just encourage you this body that we got to look for these kind of solutions to resolve because once the designation was made for ground and surface water, it's about the industry flow standard and how much water we got to put back in the river, but then at the same time, it opens another opportunity for the private sector to apply for drilling wells, <coughs> which to me, that's, that's kind of asked backwards because when you, we, when you put in more well infrastructure, you tap it into the aquifer. So when we're looking at ground and surface water designation, we got to involve all the bodies, not just the county, not just the state, but also the Makai and the really dependent on that system. And I, I, I encourage this body to have that dialogue and serious discussion. Mahalo. Can I, I just going to respond and maybe I'll try to weave because that's kind of what I do as a facilitator. So um, I just want to mahalo this voice that's usually not present in spaces like this. So, um, and to honor that. And then I think, um, you know, what we talked about, what was talked about on the first panel, what we're talking about now and policy and strategy is what we're talking about right here is um, it comes down to values, right? And holistic thinking and traditional value sets that are embedded in this place that we all benefit and get to thrive in. And so if we honor water as an akua and we deify water and we see the vai vai of that resource, then that is our priority that we fund, right? That's what we need to collectively invest in. And by doing that, we're talking about generational equity, right? Addressing systemic injustice. Um, and preparing for an unknown climate, right? I mean, all of the policy and strategy really comes down to prioritizing water and that which connects all of us. And together, we can strategize on how to, you know, present, you know, a future that, that is equitable, that is just, that is environmentally balanced, that's culturally relevant. Um, it really sounds simple, and it should be simple, but I don't know why you make it super complicated. Um, and it includes all of us. So I, to me, I just want to say that it comes from a precautionary principle approach. It comes from, even if you don't have the data, sometimes it's just talking to each other and working collectively with each other towards these first steps, these incremental um, solutions that we can you know, come together around. So um, I just want to say mahalo for, for the voices and the questions and the critique, because we need to be held, all held accountable. We all, we all are in it together. Um, to make Hawaii better, right? Mahalo Kaleo. Um, I just want to wrap this up by saying, I think just reflecting on all that's been happening, this is an innovation conference, and I'm going to say this session has really highlighted that innovation is not just technical. There's need for social innovation mm -hmm. and new conversations. And as the um, question from the front came in this discussion, it's at these edges where we learn. We have these friction points, and that is inf information that can lead to the redesign. Engineers, what is it the DT folks say, fail often and early. We need to be learning from our failures, and I think these conversations are good, are, are part of that. So thank you, everyone. Um, I don't know where the, the lunch is. I'm not going to stand between you and lunch, but let's give this panel, and actually all of you, a really round of applause for this experience.